once again, everybody. It is so good to see everyone on this beautiful winter wonderland. Aren't you excited to be in church today? Come on. <laughs> well, my name is Eric Bucci. I'm the lead pastor here, and it's an absolute delight that you're here today. And uh, I just want to thank everyone for showing so much love last week. Well, we were overwhelmed last week as we celebrated 20 years of being here. And thank you, everybody. Wasn't it a blessing to have my mom and dad here? It was awesome, right? Mom and dad, if you're watching, you need to come back. So it was so good having you here last week. And my name is Eric Bucci, by the way, and I'm the lead pastor here at Cornerstone Church. And if this is your first time joining us today or being with us today here in person, or if you're in line right now or you're in the back backyard, if you're back deck, <laughs> taking in the snow, Wherever you're a little kid, I want to let you know how much you matter to God, and I want to let everyone know, this is what my parents said. They said, you know what, it's all right to be watching online, she said, but when we came in here, we felt the Spirit of God just vibrating in us. It's so much better here. I'm going to tell you, everyone, let them know how much better it is to be here. Come on, nice and loud. So we would love to have you here come to Cornerstone Church and be a part of what's taking place today, and so... I don't know about you, but I found it beautiful. I was getting a little frustrated yesterday. I'm driving around. Where's the winter? And then now the winter came back. So I'm, it's my fault, everybody. It's my fault. Well, we're, today we're talking about it's complicated. And, and relationships are the most wonderful, the most rewarding things in our lives. And they can also be extremely painful. And, and we wanted, uh, what we do is a lot of our complication does not need to be the case. And God wants to simplify our lives. But today we're going to talk about something a little bit different, and we'll get right into it. And it's the little secret no one will know about. How many of you have secrets that if anyone ever knew about that secret, oh boy, I'd lose my job, I'd lose my marriage, I'd lose my position. We can see what's been happening with some major news corporations where the CEO of a major news corporation was caught doing something in secret and got caught. Those politicians, there's pastors I mean, it seems like no one's exempt from this situation, these little secrets. Maybe something you're doing in the privacy of your own home and you don't think anyone knows. Maybe you're away on a business trip uh, or set, you say you're on a business trip, but you're not. And you're doing something you shouldn't be doing. Or maybe you were just scrolling through your media account, your, your Instagram, and all of a sudden the, that, that old flame from high school, whoa, Wow, I haven't talked to her. I haven't talked to him in a long time. Didn't tell your spouse, but let me just, let me just see how they're doing. The next thing you know, your heart's kind of flittering. Wow, you look like you did. When, you look better than you did when you were in high school. Whoa. My husband never told me that. Wow. Or how about this? Or how about you're single and now she's married? You had a friend of mine a number of years ago no one in this church, make it very, very clear. I, don't, I never use anyone in this church as an illustration or put anyone in that kind of capacity. I want to make that very clear to everybody. But over 25 years ago, I had a friend of mine. I was in graduate school, and uh, we were talking. We were hanging out, and he pulled me aside after we got to know each other. I said, listen, I'm really, I'm really struggling with something. I got, I got this on my chest. I got to get it off my chest. So what happened? We were in graduate school. I slept with another man's wife. I said, whoa. So I didn't expect that. Like, well, what happened? He says, well, I, I went to church with a girl in youth group. We always liked each other, but we never. She moved away with her family, and um, we just lost contact. And we started talking again, and, and I was driving from Seattle, Washington, to come to Virginia Beach, which is where the school was, Regent University, and uh, she said, why don't you stop by and say hi? So he decided, well, it's on my way. On his way? He goes all the way down to Florida. The hardy on his way. My husband's not home. He's like, I'm just going to say hi. Next thing you know, he goes down. This is a believer. He goes down to Florida, and they start meeting each other. Next thing you know, they're in bed together. And it happens for a couple of days, and he leaves. I'm like, I can't, we can't. We shouldn't be doing this. We shouldn't be doing this. We shouldn't be doing this. And he never intended to, quote, unquote, do that. But then he came to Regent University, and he told me about it. Time went on. He got married. Uh, I graduated. I flew out to see him. Uh, actually, I moved in the same area he was at for a period of time. We were in the hot tub up in the mountains. It was snowing. Uh, it was beautiful. And his wife, you know, we're good friends and all that. And, and his wife goes out to make us some more coffee. And he says, I'm really struggling. So what's going on? 
He says, like, I can't forget that girl. So I'm really struggling with it. I'm with my wife, and I, if she ever knew what happened, she'd lose so much respect for me. And, and frankly, I keep thinking about it. When I'm, when I'm together with my wife sexually, I think of her. I don't know what to do. What do I do? So we were in the hot tub, and I, I said, well, let's pray. So I was praying from the hot tub. I said, you need to get some help. And, and he didn't know how it happened. And, uh, and I don't know, what, I, I don't know what, if he ever told his wife, but I knew he was struggling with it. And he's a believer. And he fell in the wrong way. And, you know, I suspect there are a number of you here today. Maybe right now you're involved with a relationship. Maybe you haven't gotten involved sexually. But maybe you're having talks with this person and maybe the person at work, you really look forward to seeing this person. You go by their desk, just get a little pitter-patter in your heart. Oh, you know, and you look forward to seeing this person and, hey, it's nothing on. I, 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 she's praying for my husband. I'm praying for, uh, for her husband or whatever, or wife. Or, and, and you're saying, let's pray for each other. And you kind of confide in each other. I care about your marriage. And this starts to happen. And you use all this Christianese to make it legitimate. Hey, it's okay. But man, wow, she really is something else. Or he's really something else. And, and it's just going in your mind. And you're wondering what's taking place. And I'll never forget talking to my friend about this when we were back in graduate school. I said, what happened? How did you end up going to bed with this girl? I mean, come on. This is, how did it happen? He said, well, to be honest with you, uh, we broke up, and then for years I was fantasizing about her. I'd think about her, and I would fantasize about her. In other words, in other words you, had, you kept having dress rehearsals with her. Yes, I was. I was fantasizing about her. And when he came into contact with her, Preparation meets opportunity. Prepare with lust. And then she became available and he fell. My friends, this can happen with all sorts of situations. And, and maybe today you feel a sense of dread and, and I, I cannot believe I did this. Listen, uh, first of all, I want to let you know something. We're not about condemning anybody here. We're about Jesus Christ. We're about healing. Okay? And the little secret, your little secrets will control you. But what we have to do is get rid of the secrets and shine the light. No one will know. And today we're going to be talking about sex. That's right, sex. And by the way, God made sex. God was in the Garden of Eden. He wasn't like, oh my gosh, I can't believe they're doing that. Oh my God, I mean, oh me. No, that's not what happened. God created it. It's a beautiful thing that God made. God made animals, and yeah, they have sex, but no, no, human beings are different. There's something that more that takes place when a man and woman get together. And, and what are we to do in our broken society? And I, I just wanted to share a, a, another story with you. I just shared one story. I, another story would happen. There was this, this woman who was known to sleep around a little bit, and uh, the guys knew that. And so they said, hey, let's, let's take this girl. Let's put her on the spot. So they found her. They grabbed her, and they threw her at Jesus' feet and said, Jesus, she was caught in the middle of adultery. And they're trying to get her, and they're trying to get Jesus. Teacher, they said, this woman was caught in the very act of adultery, you have to understand in Jewish law, Mosaic law, you could stone someone and kill them over that. However, over the Roman government, the Jewish people did not have that power to do that without Roman authority. So they're trying to trip up Jesus. And maybe today you feel like you've been thrown to church, like, oh my gosh, I don't know we're going to talk about this. And you feel condemned and you feel all this. Listen, I was just reading through the Bible in a year, which I highly recommend been doing it for over 20 years. What do I keep talking about? Because I get so much out of it, and I want to encourage you to join me. Yesterday I was reading about Peter, who, did, who actually cursed. He didn't know Christ three times, denied Christ three times. And Judas, who betrayed Jesus, both sinned. One cried and, bit, and wept bitterly, but came back to Jesus. The other one made a mistake and killed himself. See, the enemy will tempt you to do something you shouldn't be doing, and then to damn you, and that's what he wants to do. We're not about condemnation. We're about conviction and repentance and new days. 
We're not better than anyone else. And this is what happened. Teacher just said, this woman was caught in the act of adultery, and they kept demanding an answer. So he stood up again, and he said, all right, but let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. We hear this quoted all the time. He's without sin, throw the first stone, right? We hear that all the time. So what did Jesus, this is religious people. These are church people. So what does Jesus do? He says that, and then he does something quite extraordinary. He kind of gets back down, gets his etch a sketch. He goes back down on the ground. He begins to write. I think he was writing the mistresses of those different religious people. Susan. Mary, right? And so then he stopped down and, and he wrote in the dust. When the accused heard this, they slipped away one by one, beginning with what? The oldest, because the oldest knows they were in trouble. Until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the women. Then Jesus stood up again and said to the woman, Where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she said. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I. Go ahead and live like you want to live. It's okay. I don't condemn you. Is that what it says? I'm sorry, everybody. What does it say? Go and what? Sin no more. more. You know what sin means? Missing the mark. So Jesus doesn't say, hey, it's okay, and I'm okay. He says, no, go and sin no more. We all make mistakes. And the enemy's job is to condemn and they damn you. That's what he wants to do. He wants to get you caught and make you feel so guilty that you give up on God. I can never get married to the right person. I can never get married to this man or woman because she's a virgin and I'm not. I can never get back right with God again. I'm on my third marriage. How can I possibly get this right? I'm, I'm exempt from the Lord Jesus Christ. And I have news for you. What Christ did on the cross is enough. He's not here to condemn. He's here to heal. And so it's a mistake to say that it doesn't matter. It does matter. But the reason I'm bringing this up first is I recognize right here in this room, probably 70% of us in this room have some sexual brokenness in our lives. Maybe you were abused as a child. Maybe you had multiple sex partners. I don't know what you've been through, but chances are everyone in this room has struggled with sexual issues. Either it happened to you, or you know somebody, or you're dealing with someone's relationship like that. So we can sit here and and act like we're all innocent. This is a big area of our lives that God wants to bring healing to you, and he wants to bring healing to all of us. But the only way we can have healing is we got to deal with it. The Bible says in Romans 8, 1, there is therefore now no condemnation. What happened is Judas, when he betrayed Christ, The enemy said, you blew it. Go kill yourself. You're done. And the enemy will tell you, you've blown it. You were involved with that same-sex relationship that you were involved with. You were involved with this other thing. You're damned. You will never be accepted. You might as well just end it all. And God would say, no. There's no condemnation in Christ. There's conviction, but no condemnation. There's no condemnation to those who are in Christ. Are you in Christ? If you're not, there is condemnation. Who does not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. God wants us to walk in the Spirit. Listen, we've all made mistakes, everybody. And the sexual sin is a, is a big, big, big problem on our culture today. Why? Because it's used in everything. It's basically the bait that the society uses to sell things. Netflix series. You want to sit there and binge Netflix or Hulu, whatever you look, all these programs. Everyone's having sex, right? You, you see someone, the next thing you know, they're in bed. I mean, sex is all over the place. They sleep with each other. I mean, it's very unusual to see a married couple uh, having any kind of relationship in movies. It's always about someone that, you know, has sex with somebody. There's a uh, blank in the blank, right? I mean, you're going to say sex and whatever. You know, all these programs, sex, sex, all these innuendos, all the music we listen to, we're inundated with it. Magazine covers and uh, pop-up ads constantly, sex, 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 sex. It's all about us and all around us. We hear about it constantly. And it's very difficult. And so what do we do with all these situations? Well, back to our series. Here it is. I'm in a relationship, and it's complicated. Sexual misconduct will complicate your life like nothing else. And God does not want to complicate your life. This is the truth of the matter. Sin complicates your life. God's ways simplify your life. How does it feel when you have a secret? How's your relationship when you have a secret? It complicates things, right? 
And, and why, is, why is he so cold to me? Why is he so frigid to me? Why is my relationship with my wife so weird? Because there's complications that are not been dealt with. Or maybe, I don't know what you're going through, but sin complicates your life. And Jesus makes life extremely simple, yet profound and deep and satisfying. The enemy has come to kill and destroy. God made sex. It is good, he said. But our culture, by the enemy, has messed it up to wound God's people and to wound the world. So sex, God's way, equals amazing sex. Oh, Pastor, how can you say that? I just said it. It's not mine. It's the Bible. And God wants sex to be in the right way. You know, this is what the truth of the matter is. Uh, a lot of people make a lot about sex. So much. In a marriage, for example, sex is a big deal when you're not having it. And when you are, it's a small part of your marriage. It's what counselors and, and people have told us. But it's an issue. A lot of people right now have been sexually abused and all sorts of issues that are going on. It's just sex, our culture said. It doesn't make it. Hey, man, it's just sex. You, you prude people. I was just listening to a bunch of interviews and saying... Oh, man, you know, I, I, I was monogamous, and that was wrong, and you shouldn't wait till you get married to have sex. Go ahead. You get, hey, you wouldn't buy a pair of shoes without trying them on first, right? So why would you get married to someone without trying it on? You know what the truth of the matter is? Secular institutions have done studies, and people that live together or cohabitate before they get married have a higher rate of divorce than those who do not. So there's a whole lot we could say about it. It's just sex. In fact... The Apostle Paul talks about this in the city of Corinth 2,000 years ago. It was a very sexualized city. You think we're sexualized here. It was even worse. You had these temples everywhere. And what would happen is if you were a religious person, if you were a good citizen, what you would do is you'd go downtown, you'd go to the, you'd go to the temple, you'd have sex with a prostitute, you'd give an offering, and you'd go home, and you'd be with your wife again. Hey, no big deal. Where are you going, honey? Oh, I'm going to church. Talk about church growth. That's what happened in those days. Seriously, this is it was part of the culture. In fact, most religions in the world usually empower the man to abuse a woman. Not in Christianity. <laughs> Food's for the stomach, they said. And the stomach is for food. Hey, man, it doesn't make a difference. It's just, it's just no big deal. If you're hungry, you eat. If you're thirsty, you drink. If you have an itch, you scratch it. It's just physical. It's nothing more than that. Really? Yeah, that's all it is. Then why is it that if someone gets in a car accident, they get okay and, and they forgive that person, but why is it when someone is involved with sexual problems or someone is, has a sexual relationship or someone is abused, or how about if someone is abused? Why is it someone that is abused, it might take them the rest of their life to deal with it? Why is it that someone who is raped struggles with it, yet if, if they're hit, it's different? Because there's something different about sex than any other sin. By the way, sex is not sin. A misappropriation of sex is sin. And sin simply means missing the mark. So food's for the stomach and the stomach's for food. But God's will destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for sexual immorality. Hello, everybody. Our bodies have not been designed for multiple sex partners. Why are there venereal diseases uh, rampant in our world today? Why did AIDS happen? It's because of sexually transmitted diseases. You're not designed by God to have multiple sex partners. You are designed by God, one man, one woman, one lifetime, monogamous in marriage. That's the design. You go against the design, you, you void the warranty of the manifestation manufacturer, the designer of all things. Don't blame God if things start breaking because you go against the design. I'm just saying what the Word of God says. Now, the body is not for sexual immorality. The word immorality there is pornea. It's where we get the word pornography. But for the Lord and the Lord for the body. We're made for God, by God, for God, you see? And that's how it is. Why our sexual sins are worse than others. I'm so glad you asked. What did the Apostle Paul say? This is what he said to them. He said, flee sexual morality. He didn't say flirt with it. He didn't say investigate. I can't believe they're doing that now. Can you believe what they're doing? Let me click on that investigate. Right? 
No, he says, flee, run away from, don't negotiate. I'm not talking about leave your jacket behind, get away from it, don't even, don't even play with it, get away. That's what he's saying, flee sexual morality. Why? Every sin that a man does or woman is outside the body. But he or she who commits sexual immorality sins against the Lord. Wait a minute. It doesn't say that, does it? He or she who, who commits sexual immorality sins against the other person. It doesn't say that, does it? Even though those things are true. He or she that commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Why is that? The Bible, and, and incidentally, come on, everybody, it's instinctively, we know what happens in a culture. We can see the, the devastation, the problems that people are facing as a result of sexual sin. It causes economic disaster, broken homes, broken families, multi-generational issues. We can go on and on and on. I don't need to give you all the collateral damage. But why are sexual sins so bad? It's because they sin against your own body. You're not designed to do those things. You go against your design. You hurt yourself and you hurt other people. And see, this is what the Apostle Paul says. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot or a prostitute? Please understand, everybody, the culture back in those days, it was common to go to the local prostitute prostitutes at the temple and go back and go to church. Hey, how you doing? Oh, I just went to the prostitute. It was fantastic. I just paid my bill. I'm, I'm good to go. It's, hey, it's just, it's just sex. It's no big deal, man. It's just sex. I love my wife. You know, she doesn't always give me what I want, so it's okay once in a while. I kind of veer off a little bit. My husband and I, we don't get along too well, but man, he really meets my emotional needs or this or the other. You know, I feel so alive when I'm with this person. And so it's no big deal. It's just sex. It's just sex. It's no big deal. So this is the culture. Listen, by the way, this is what was going on back in Corinth. In the church, mind you. Okay? Do you not know that the bodies are members of Christ? Shall then I take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? Certainly not. Or do you not know that he or she who is joined to a harlot is what? One body with her. And then he quotes the Old Testament in Genesis. For the two, he said, shall become one sarks, one flesh. The two shall become one flesh. You see, animals have sex. People make love. And there's something that happens different than animals. There is a joining together. When a man and a woman get together, and imagine, if you will, here we have Johnny and Sue. Good-looking people. He's got glasses. So let's just say that, you know, they love each other. Oh, I love you. You love me. And, and they said, you know, and the next thing you know, they're not married yet, but, you know, you know, it's okay. It's okay. It's all right. It's just sex. So they get together. And what happens is when you get together with someone sexually, and let's say they, then they leave that relationship. What happens is that person leaves part of the other person on the other person. You lose a piece of yourself. Because you're joined together and you pull apart. You join another person and you pull apart. You join another person and you pull apart. You know what begins to happen? Sexual intimacy, bring, sexual intimacy brings intimacy. And so you keep on taking the tape and taking the tape off. You, and I have a hard time connecting with my husband. I don't know what's going on. I can't connect to her because you have so many sexual partners. Or maybe you're looking at pornography or involved with something else. And so what happens is there's something broken here. This is why God is against it, not because he's against sex. He made sex. It's a beautiful thing. It's wonderful, right? But this sex in the wrong context does extraordinary damage. Fire in a fireplace is great. It's wonderful. You can cook things, right? But fire outside the fireplace, look at California, what happened with the wildfires. And so this is what begins to happen. Are you saying for the rest of my life I have to live with these shards upon me? Let me just say something very important. I didn't notice as a kid. God may forgive your sins, and he does, but sometimes the consequences are still left behind. You're going to heaven, you're saved, but the, the consequences can still be there. That broken relationship could still be there. The hurt can still be there, and it might take a while to get healed from it. I'm just going to tell you, everybody, I used to think, oh, okay, do what I want, and God will forgive me. Yeah, God will forgive you. 
King David, God forgave King David for committing adultery with another man's wife and killing the man. God forgave him, and the line of Christ came through David, which gives us all hope. But for the remainder of David's life, he had strife in his family, sexual misconduct, all sorts of problems. It was collateral damage based upon because of the sexual sin. Now, God can heal, God can restore. Why am I saying this? Young people in particular, they're young. You think, it's, I'll just hook up and that's no big deal. You hook up and keep doing this, you're going to hurt yourself. You're not designed by God for that. God wants you to be whole. But there's good news, everybody. God can make you whole. God is God of new beginnings. And I've known people, for example, Doug Wise, who we had here a couple times, talked about a couple. Uh, I shared with him privately. He talked to me about a couple. The man was visiting a prostitute. In fact, they actually came to our conference from another church. And he used to visit prostitutes and all sorts of things. And then they, what happened was the, the marriage was over. They decided to, to stick with it. And now today, 20 years later, they have a great marriage. God healed the marriage. We've known prostitutes that went to Teen Challenge. You go to their wedding, and you would never know for a moment that that woman ever had that in her background. God is a God of new beginnings. But I must be truthful with you. Sexual sins hurt you, and we need to deal with this issue in our lives. You see, or do you not know that he who's joined with a harlot is one body with her? For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. The two become one one flesh, but he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. The two become one. So you keep pulling that away. You keep pulling that away. You see, Christ, we become one in Christ. Christ is inside of me. And the Bible talks about that we are the bride of Christ. Christ is the groom. We are joined with Christ. Now check this out. It's my body. I can do what I want. No, it's not your body. If you're giving your life to Jesus Christ, if you're not a Christian, I guess you're okay. But if you are a Christian, your body's not your own. Why? Well, or do you not know? Flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, which is so amazing because they go to the temples and have sex at the temples. He's saying, no, no, no. You're the temple of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit resides in you whom you have from God, and you are not your own. You have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Glorify your God. But I, but I have these urges. I'm single. And man, like, how am I supposed to shut down the factory after all this work? I got the urges. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Well, we're going to talk about that in a few moments. How to be free from sexual sin. First one is this. Flee sexual sin. Don't flirt with it. Okay, you ever get stung by a mosquito? Am I the only? I hate mosquitoes. But this is something I learned by being in the woods. The best thing to do when you have a mosquito bite is don't scratch it. Just leave it alone, and it will get better on its own. But you have to fight the scratch. Lust is the same thing. The more you scratch the lust, the, the bigger and more problems it creates, the more pain it creates, it begins to bleed, it begins to really begins to itch even worse. Best thing to do is, is to avoid it, is to replace it. And so flee sexual sin. Don't flirt with sexual sin. Yeah, I know, but I don't know. When I go to the office, you know what he said to me the other day? He called me his work wife. Please don't use that terminology. This is, my, this is my work wife. This is my work husband. No, don't even say that. Or if you find yourself going to, anyhow, you find yourself seeing somebody and you're, oh my goodness. Let me go ahead and talk. I, I'm not thinking, oh, I'm, I'm just talking to the person. I, you know, and boy, you look beautiful today. My husband never says that to me. Well, you're a sexy thing. Well, thank you so much. <laughs> you hear all this crazy stuff, right? If married, you're going to like this one. Have sex if you're married. Okay, now that I've offended everybody, let's move on. <laughs> the Bible says in Corinthians, do not what? Deprive each other of what? Sexual relations unless you both agree to refrain from sexual intimacy for a decade. <laughs> it doesn't say that, does it? It says what? Limited time. limited time. What does limited time mean? In the Greek, it means what? Limited time, which means a short period of time. A limited time so that you 
can give yourself more completely to prayer. I'm going to a prayer meeting. Not tonight, honey. I don't have to use my headache anymore. Use that one. I'm going to prayer. No, no, no. For a limited time. Afterwards, you should come together sexually again so that Satan won't be able to what? Tempt you because of your lack of self-control. It, listen, if you're married, it is a part of the marriage covenant. You should, that's what you're, when you consummate the marriage, it is a marriage covenant. That's the consummation of that marriage. I can go a lot deeper into what it means. I don't have time today to break that down. But if you're married and you're not having intimacy, maybe there's medical issues. And I understand that it does happen. Maybe there's some situations that are creating a problem. And I get that. But if you're married and not having sex, it's not a good thing. And, 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 well, all he cares about is sex. Well, probably the case. <laughs> well, let me just be honest. I mean, sometimes it, it is a big deal. In, in fact, I've heard it in some articles that women rather go gardening than have sex sometimes. And, and part of the reason is because the man's probably thinking about himself only. We've been, caught, we've been taught in a culture, it's all about the man's needs. And if you constantly look at pornography and involved with things like that, what happens is it robs the marriage bed of its strength. Time Magazine, not a religious publication by any... They're out of, they're out of, out of print, by the way. They had, a, they had a basic story about pornography and how it destroys people's sex lives. It makes it impotent. That's what pornography can do. So pornography does not make your relationship better. And right now, it's everywhere, everybody. And we're not saying it because, oh, gee, we don't want you having fun. No, it actually hurts you. It actually breaks down the ability for you to even enjoy sex in a proper context. So the Bible says you shouldn't, unless you're having trouble with sex in your marriage, you probably need to go talk to somebody, a professional counselor or something, or somebody says, listen, on our marriage, we're not together. And, and you need to work that. That should be something that you should work towards everybody. And God can restore what the enemy broke. It might take a while, but it's important that you get together sexually. It's part of your design. It's part of what God gave to us to be intimate with our spouse. And so that's part of it. And if you're not, it's going to be very difficult for a man or a woman. If you're being deprived at home, listen, you know, I have to be honest with you. If I'm, if I'm having a full meal, a vending machine is not very tempting. Now, I'm not blaming. It doesn't give you an excuse to have an affair because she's not taking care of you or he's not taking care of you. But it makes it a whole lot more difficult. Don't use sex as a weapon. Do not deprive each other. Some people are going to put that on my dashboard. I'm going to put it in my mirror in the bathroom so she's going to see it every day. <laughs> Guys, listen, it's important to get it fixed and get it right. Get your relationship fixed. And so God made sex. It's important in a marriage. All right, everybody, I hope you understand that. So flee sexual sin. Don't flirt. If married, have sex. Have it in the right way. Tell God what you're going through. You know what the Word of God says? It says, if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. If you're like, well, you know, I love God, but I sleep around. I love God, but I look at porn. I love God, but I like to flirt with the guys or the girls. I love God, but I do this or the other. No, you don't. If you love me, you obey my commandments, but I can't help myself. Yes, you can. Well, that's another topic for another day. We have to start taking start taking responsibility for our actions. You're not an animal, okay? You can control, but we have to get help from God and each other, okay? If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in what? Secret. Light. You are only as healthy as your secrets. Is your life transparent? Can your spouse, can your, can your friends see all the stuff you're putting on here? Can they see your social media accounts? Okay? But if we walk in the light as he's in the light, what happens? We have fellowship with what? One another. That's right. That's why it's so important to be part of a small group. Don't go through life alone. The whole world tells you, do it this way. And what's the only place that I know of in the world that you are told to do the right thing with sex is the church. 
You need believers to encourage you, whether you're single or married or divorced. If we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sins. So you may be broken, but God brings healing. Don't let the enemy sell you short. It doesn't mean you have to be a second-rate Christian. No, God can take a prostitute. God can take an adulterer and turn him or her into a mighty man or woman of God. Don't let the enemy sell you short. There are new days in Christ Jesus. It doesn't make a difference what you've done. God is a God of second chances and God is a God of healing in Jesus' name. Neither do I condemn you, said Jesus. Go and sin no more. How to be free from sexual sin. Flee, don't flirt. If married, men, okay. Tell God and tell others no secrets. Listen, you know, when you are weak, what's to stop you from clicking on the wrong thing? What's to, cl- what's to stop you from clicking on a relationship you shouldn't have? Uh, let me just say, everyone should, have pass co- everyone should have a passcode, and your spouse or somebody else should know what you're doing online. Parents, I know it's hard. What are your kids looking at? I mean, the stuff that's on here, it used to be really, really difficult to find something bad when I was growing up. You had to find some old magazine someplace that someone's father had or something. Like today, it's right here before you. And in a weak moment, guys or women, in a weak moment, you're away on a business trip and uh, there's something there. I, I'm going to look at this or I'm going to go down to the hotel bar and talk to that person. That's no big deal. When you're in a weak moment, what happens is you have to create barriers that make it more difficult to give you a more chance to think. So if you, if you can't get into the porn places and you can't look at that person or whatever, it makes it difficult. You should have a password that someone else has on all your devices. And your spouse, if you're married, your spouse should see. If you're single, guys, girls, get some other, someone else that you're accountable to that has your passcode for, for explicit content and, and make sure they have it. Why? It makes it more difficult to fall because we all have weak moments. Stuff happens. Tell others. Uh, a number of years ago, uh, I was in New York City with a friend of mine here in the church, and um, I just give you an example. I, I, I saw someone, surprisingly, in a, uh, we were at a conference, and I ran into somebody that we used to know, a, a husband and wife couple, and the woman uh, was always, you know, very nice, comes to me, hi, how you doing? And give me a big hug. I'm like, whoa, whoa. And he said, let's take a picture together. So we take a picture together, and she puts her arm around me, and she grabs my buttocks. I'm like, what the heck is going on? So immediately I go, excuse me. And I told my friend who's in this church, I said, that woman just touched me, blah, 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 blah. I told him, I said, I feel uncomfortable. And I told my wife, now what did I do that for? Put light on it. There's nothing going to happen. And incidentally, two years later, she, she, uh, she divorced her husband and cheated on him. The signs were there. She's putting out signs. She's throwing signs. He gave her little hints, right? And she was trying to bait me. She's trying to get me to take the hook. And if you start a relationship, start talking, oh, it's no big deal. She said, no, no, no. She used to go to our church in the past. And, that, and so what did I do? I told him. I said, listen, this is what happened. I, I, I dealt with her right away. I don't want to keep that a secret. No one saw it. He, my friend didn't see it. You know, he's over, he's over taking the He didn't see what happened behind there, but I knew it was wrong. Yeah, but my heart pitter-patters. So what your heart pitter-patters? Just because you're attracted to someone sexually doesn't mean you married the wrong person. It's called you're a human being. And we're not animals. We don't have to listen to our passions. But get it in the light. I got it in the light. So it had no power over me. These things happen, everybody. These things happen. There's been other circumstances. I've known people that have allowed things to take place Listen, I don't care if they, if they friend you and it's someone in high school and you want to talk to them. I can't believe how you're doing. You look like you look better than you did in your high school. Ooh, do I really? And the next thing you know, you start talking online. No big deal. Hey, we're just friends. I'm praying for her marriage. She's praying for mine. I had a friend that told me, not in this church. Oh, she's praying. We share our marital problems. And you're, what you're going to be doing is sharing a bed real quick. You better knock it off and stop giving me that baloney about oh, she's praying for you. Yeah, she's praying for you, and you're praying on her, and you're deceiving yourself. And this is what has happened. Don't play with 
sexual sin, it will hurt you like no other sin. Tell others, no secrets in my life. Tell somebody. Therefore, confess your sins to God only and pray that God would forgive you and you'll be healed. Is that what it is? Excuse me, is that what it says? You see, in the non-Catholic church, oh, I, 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 don't go to the, I don't go to the priest and I don't go to confession because I go straight to God. Well, you know what? The Catholic church gets something right. It's important to confess your sins to another believer. They choose the priest. You should have somebody you can confess your sins to. Say, so you know what? I did this. I'm struggling with this. Will you pray for me? God will forgive you from sexual sin. He will, he'll forgive you from sexual sin. He will. But you'll get healed from sexual sin if you include the body of Christ. Now, you don't go tell everyone your business. You'd be, you'd be selective. But I want to encourage you, if you're living in a secret lifestyle, and then, by the way, it doesn't, it's not, I don't have to be a prophet to realize this stuff going on right here this morning, stuff going on with people watching online. I don't have to be a prophet. It's powerful. But God does not want to see you get stuck in these things. God wants to see you free. He wants to see you free. You don't have to live in, in addictions. You don't have to live with shame. You don't have to live thinking if she ever knew or he ever knew, I'd be done. You don't have to live that way. God wants you free. God loves you. He wants better things for you. The enemy wants you to pull a Judas and, and destroy yourself. And God says, come back to me. You don't have to live with this addiction. You don't have to live with this shame. Jesus was, took shame for us on the cross. So you and I don't have to have shame. It's your design not to have shame. So you don't have to have shame. Confess your sins with one another. Maybe some of you need to tell somebody. This week, that's your assignment. Get involved with small groups. You have relationships. I, I want to invite everyone to go to a small group. I'm going to go ahead and do it because I'm doing the small group. I think it's one of the most important groups we do here at Cornerstone Church. It's called Freedom. Every believer should go through freedom. I've been through it so many times. Every time I go through it, I'm blessed. We're going to have it Sunday evening starting February 27th, I believe it is, at 6.30. It goes about an hour and, tw uh, hours and 20 minutes or so. I encourage you to sign up for Freedom. Go ahead and sign up for today. It's going to be a great group. We're going to have men and women in there. We'll separate for different things when we can talk about things uh, for men and, and for women when we get to those areas. But I'm telling you right now, it's for every believer. Whether you're full of sin or not, we all got issues. All of us should be walking in freedom. And I want to encourage you, if you have not been in Freedom, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to talk about it. You should go to the Freedom Small Group. I'm going to say it again. You should enroll for the Freedom Small Group. If we have to fill the sanctuary, we will. It's that important to get free, to know how to get free and allow the love of Christ to wash over you, to stay free. And you have to be in relationship with other believers or you can't really do this. You can't do it by yourself. You need God and you need his body. Don't live the Christian life by yourself. Get connected to the body, to live in the body. Don't do it alone. Flee sexual sin. Don't flirt with it. If married, get your sexual health right. Tell God. Tell others. No secrets. And set up safeguards. We talked about safeguards. Someone has to have your passcode. Have an internet thing. I'm serious, everybody. Get safeguards put there. If you go on a business trip, then... Call your wife. Listen, having lunch with somebody, an associate, if you're a tracker, don't do that. But I have to. Well, find another way to get away, get away from it then. then. Then tell your wife or your husband about it. And uh, women, don't be offended if your husband says, I find her attractive. Men, do not be offended if your wife says, I'm, I find myself a gravitational pull with this person. Let's be real with each other. Let's help each other out. Why, am I not, I'm not enough for him? Then I should divorce him. No, he's, he's human beings. I'm not saying you're going to be attracted to somebody else, but you might be. I'm not alone with a woman that's not my wife. We set parameters up. I have a window in my office. I open the window. I make sure someone's here and I counsel. So I, don't, I don't play around. I'm, I'm, listen, there's been better men than me that have fallen. I am not above it. And I think my saving grace is I recognize that I'm a human being and I'm not above it i got to be careful, and so do you. Okay? So set up safe guards. Okay? This is why. We want to have life in Christ. Therefore, and I ask the worship team to come up. Therefore, if anyone except those that struggle with sex. Is that what it says? No. Therefore, if anyone is 
in Christ, he or she is a what? New creation. You are born again, but you got to be willing to die to yourself. A new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things, all things, including sexual sin, have become new. God can wipe your slate clean. You do not have to walk around with condemnation. You don't have to walk around with being blackmailed and feel like if I ever got caught. Christ Jesus wants to forgive you. He wants to set you free. He wants to clean you so you can walk with confidence before him. Listen, everybody. Let's stop being fake. Let's start being real. Let's help each other. Let's be the people of God has called us to become. Let not let sin, sexual sins, hold you back from what God has for you. This is a big deal because when you sex, when you uh, sin sexually, you sin against Against your own body. Every other sin is not that way. But sexual sin hurts you because God created sex for one man, one woman, one lifetime, and unless it's in that design, you're gonna hurt yourself. Guys, I'm telling you this is important. We have generations on here. We have we have generations at stake right now. There are generations at stake right now. Your grandchildren, your great grandchildren are waiting for you to get right. And if you're single, why don't you just say to yourself, you know what? Tell someone, from this stand, this point forward, I'm going to be a virgin. I'm not going to sleep around anymore. I'm going to wait. If you're living with somebody, stop having sex and not, don't live together anymore. Say, you know what? Let's get married. First of all, she's the right person. He's the right person. And say, we're going to abstain from this and we're going to do it right. How beautiful will it be? You get to go down the aisle and say, you know what? We took a vow together to be pure God restored us and today I'm marrying you and you're marrying me guys it's worth it I hope you understand that this is for your good God loves you and he has good good plans for you let me ask you to bow your heads I'm going to pray right now Father Lord I recognize today that <clears throat> there are a number of people here probably a high percentages of people in this room and those watching online that struggle with sexual sin. Lord, maybe they've been abused, molested. Maybe they were their abuser. And maybe right now they're involved with a relationship that's dangerous. Or they're involved with an adulterous relationship even right now. Father, I ask in Jesus' name that your conviction would come upon them. They would turn away from this sin. They would turn to you and they would confess it to another brother or sister and they would get free. Father, I pray that Cornerstone Church would be a place that someone could come if they're struggling with same-sex attraction. Someone could come if they're struggling with pornography, if they're struggling with adultery, if they're struggling with all these other issues, Father. This would be a place where we help each other. This is a safe haven where we can let your grace wash us and heal us. Father, we pray for restoration in Jesus' name. And thank you, Father, you've come to rescue us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I want you to look up here just for one second. I just wanted to encourage you. <laughs> Have you given your life to Jesus Christ? I'm not talking about believing in Jesus. So does the enemy. Have you given your life to Christ? We say, I'm not going to live anymore for myself. I hand over my life to God. Have you done that? If you have not done that, you're not saved. You're a religious person. Maybe you're, you, you follow the Christian philosophy. But until you lay down your life to Jesus and give your life to him where you're not in charge anymore, you don't call the shots, he does. Until you're at that place, you're not saved. Have you ever got to that place? Maybe you did and you walked away. Today is the day of salvation. I'm gonna ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes one more time. How many of you would say here today, Lord, uh, Pastor, if I were to die right now, I don't know for sure, I'd go in heaven. Or maybe I used to walk with God and I'm not walking with God right now, but I wanna get right. Can I just see a quick show of hands? So, Pastor, come on, let's be real. Today, I want to give my life to Christ for the first time. Or I want to renew my commitment to him. Anyone today would say that today? Be real enough to say that. Thank you, thank you. Anyone else? Okay, let's pray this prayer. And uh, as well, those that are watching online, even if it's a year later, even if it's five years later, it doesn't make a difference. The word of God doesn't, doesn't change. God's calling you. He loves you. He sees you. He sees what you're doing. Don't turn away. He sees you right now. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and, and repeat this prayer in your heart. Lord Jesus... I believe you're the son of God. I believe you died on the cross and rose again from the dead. I ask you to forgive me of everything I've ever done wrong, both known and unknown. And I choose to step down 
from being in charge of my life. Lord, my life is yours. You are God, and I am no longer God in my life. Thank you for forgiving me of all of my sins. I choose to follow you from this day forward in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, we believe you got born again. Jesus never says, hey, say a prayer and you're good to go. And he says, this is what Jesus says. He says, come follow me. Cornerstone Church is a group of believers that are following Jesus together. In the front pocket of your seat, there are these cards. You want to pull it out? It says, I'm making a decision today for the first time or renew my commitment. If you want to go ahead and fill that out. In a few moments, we're going to put it in the um, offering boxes. Or you, what you can also do is you can... Um, you can text us as well. Look for the number. I always forget the number. I should know it by now. You get your cell phone out. You can text 860-499-4888. That's 860-499-4888. And text BELIEVE. We'll help you with the next steps. At the end of the service, we're going to have people up front to pray with you. Also, people at the front desk. Take a Bible. We want to help you guys. If you don't have a small group to sign up for, you need to sign up for freedom. I'm telling you right now, it will change your life. And I'm not saying that because I'm doing the group. I'm telling you, it's that good. It will change your life. And I want to encourage you, everyone can become more free in Jesus' name. Amen? Hey, there's four different ways you can give. You don't have to give, but you get to give. What happened here? Oops, wrong way. Okay, you can text Cornerstone Cheshire to 833-245-5608. You can go to cornerstonecheshire.com. There are boxes in the back. You can put those cards, or you can also put, do our Push Pay app as well. Okay, everybody? May the Lord bless you. May he keep you. May his grace and his power purify you to walk in your calling as a son and daughter of Christ unashamed in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.